Okay, here's a question for you. Who is that? Alan Turing. Good answer. Everybody else recognise Alan Turing? Alan Turing has um, been in the news recently because of a movie called The Imitation Game, which tells the story of how during the Second World War, Nazi Germany had a code machine called Enigma that was reckoned to be unbreakable and was the source of uh, all their coded communications to aircraft, to U-boats in the North Atlantic, to um, armies around the, the world. And Alan Turing at Bletchley Park I figured that to beat a machine, you had to invent a machine that was better than the machine that you were up against. So he uh, invented a machine called Colossus that was such a large computer that only a girl could operate it. <laughs> and uh, Winston Churchill um, credits the work at Bletchley Park with essentially um, winning the war, or at the very least shortening the war by a couple of years. And the so-called ultra-intelligence that was um, gained from decoding the Enigma um, codes was classified for 50 years after the Second World War. Such was the sensitive nature um, of it. If you want to find out more about uh, Alan Shearing, the movie The Imitation Game is uh, well worth watching. And I discovered quite by chance that there's a book about Alan Shearing which is the same title as Ian Reid's biography. And, uh, <laughs> that, also is, uh, that also is available um, in the shops. <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment in public. Just me. What do you think? You were the Ian Reid I was talking about there. No, 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 that stupid Ian Reid that I was thinking of. Um, the... You're not really stupid Ian Reid. <laughs> Get on with it. What you have in the, in the parables is really code. It's code that Jesus is communicating to, to the crowds. It's extraordinary truth hidden in plain sight. And each of the, the three evenings here, we're going to think about a particular parable and what is coded into the, the story. I guess if you ask people why Jesus spoke in parables, the answer that will come out most often is that he used everyday things so that the people would understand him. And that's not really how the New Testament explains parables or why they are used. In fact, if you were to summarise, it would be Jesus uses ordinary stories so that the people would understand him, <laughs> rather than so that they will. So it's in truth with meaning. But these are earth-shaking, life-changing stories. One of the reasons for the, the three parables that we're thinking about here is that in a couple of weeks' time I'm going to be in Ecuador speaking at the National Student Conference and they wanted to look at these three um, parables. So you know we've had open mic stuff at the end of the, the morning Bible teaching with uh, Paul, what I would like to do is to have one or two comments recorded, not immediately after the evening sessions, but sometime while you're here, if Mary Ann could grab one or two of you to say something about each of the parables, then when I go to Ecuador, I can take you with me and you can speak to the Ecuadorian students and that will encourage them. 
they won't understand the thing you say, though. They say because they're Spanish, but uh, they'll think you look very nice and they'll smile warmly at you, and their subtitles will be uh, will be provided. And in fact, the, the book that Josue, who leads the work in Ecuador, who's married to Ruth, who's on TSCF staff here in New Zealand, has been reading in preparation for their national student conference, describes a parable as an earthquake, that it's something that shakes people's uh, foundations. And in Ecuador, they, they have earthquakes, so they're not being completely blasé um, about it. Why does Jesus communicate in code? We'll see a lot of this explained in the parable we're looking at uh, tonight, but it's to do with the hardness of heart of his listeners. It's to do with publicly communicating more than he wants publicly known, and often giving the disciples or those who are interested a personal key to understand what is going on. And ultimately, it's because truth is decoded and is revealed by the Holy Spirit to people who are becoming spiritually awake. So the parable we're looking at tonight is the parable of the sower. It's uh, recorded in Matthew, Mark, and we're going to, to look at the version in Mark 4 verse 1 to 20. So if you want to turn to that. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered round him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. While all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants so they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and grew and produced a crop, some multiplying thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. <coughs> there somebody preaching on this once, and they say, It's a cunning pun that Jesus is using, because ears of corn and who's got ears? <laughs> Um, but that doesn't quite work in, uh, in the original language. So you have to be careful about reading things out like that. <laughs> when he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. So they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things, come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some thirtyfold, some sixty, some a hundred times what was sown. So Jesus didn't give his stories titles. He didn't
didn't have kind of opening credits with the parable of starring Jesus with Andrew and Peter in the supporting cast. The names have been given by people later on. So some people call this the parable of the sower. Other people call it the parable of the four types of soil. But you could also call it the parable of the seed. Because it's the seed that um, makes the difference. So here's a question for you. Are you smarter than a science student? No. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have a science student that can sit in the bar here? Come on, that can do biology. Well. <laughs> okay, Hamish, you can, you can be the science student. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> so we're looking for an arts student who can be smarter than him. Ben Johnson. <laughs> okay, Ben Johnson. <laughs> twice a year on Auckland University weekend and Labour Day. But I'm sure you can find them other places if only you had access to some kind of device that could access all the wisdom of the ages. No, but that would be an interesting thing to find out. Now, if you plant this in the ground, lovely as it is, do you think it will produce a network? <laughs> being, being an art student, I'm using all kinds of big words here. You probably don't understand. But, uh, computers, wire, joining. What do you reckon, science student? I suggest it could. It could. <laughs> you think we plant this? What do you think, Ben? I suggest it would have. Yeah. <laughs> so at, at the moment, you are demonstrating that you are smarter than the same out of the box now. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. One of the next Simon, you need to come and hold <laughs> this in the ground, you would get some clubs or a course or a tree producing other golf balls. 
No. No. <laughs> That's excellent, Ben. You're wiping the floor with Amos. <laughs> Amos is still thinking about that and wondering what will happen. Let me give you one that you can plant later, Hamish, and see what we, what you think about it. <laughs> Okay, here's the next one. <laughs> what do we think this is? Can I bring it up? <laughs> I think it's nothing inside. It's wrapped up oh, some kind of tinfoil chocolate wrapper. Is it supposed to be a hand in this one? How is it? Oh. I don't know what kind of chocolate. Ferrero Rocher. Oh. <laughs> Okay, very good. Okay, here we go. Do you think if you planted Ferrero Rocher, you could grow your own ambassador? Oh, oh, Hamish. <laughs> it could be polystyrene packing that goes around an electronic device in transit. <laughs> Pretty much got the same texture though. <laughs> so that's very good, Hamish. You went, uh, you went one ahead there. That was awesome. And they died of polystyrene poison. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> for a succession of colour throughout late soon and winter. He soaked that for three or four hours before planting and planted in a bold group three to four centimetres deep and five to six centimetres apart and keep the ground cool with a light mulching <laughs> and perhaps add some bulk food and water well and watch them grow. That time I lost a lot to live actually. <laughs> <laughs> a useful tip is 
Do not worry about the shape of the ball. Whichever way it is planted, usually point down, it will turn itself around and grow without much trouble. Wow. Oh. So do you think if you planted that, a nice colourful flower will grow? Yes. No. <laughs> when you planted it, I'm going to garden yard. How much teeth marks you do that? <laughs> okay, here's your last one. Smaller and smaller. Is it a piece of wheat? Correct, Hamish. to produce life. But most of those things that we looked at, you could bury them all you like and throw them wherever you want, but they're not going to reproduce. It happens because of the nature of the, the seed. And we know that God has made things the way that he has made them so that we can understand more about, more about him. And when we go on to, to understanding what the seed is, we understand that the seed is the Word of God. And it's because of the nature of the Word of God that it has the capacity to produce life and generate fruit in a way that a lot of other things do not. In fact, it's only the Word of God that has that capacity to affect change in people's lives and to produce that kind of, uh, of fruit. With the bulbs and the instructions, it was quite detailed about how you had to make a little hole and put the bulb in and this far apart from the other bulb and follow the instructions about how it kind of how it worked. When the seed is sown by the farmer in Mark's Gospel, it's not done like that according to instructions. The seed is sown abundantly. <laughs> so he walks around. <laughs> Sowing the seed, it's not very sure where it's going to land or what's going to happen to it. And it's just an abundant thing of seed going everywhere. And, and that's the way that they do it. That's the way that they do it. With a, a huge big basket walking and sowing, sowing seed, um, sowing seed everywhere. And in the story that Jesus tells, different results are observed and recorded. Some falls on the path. And the seed that falls on the path is eaten by the birds before it has a chance to germinate. It's snatched away and consumed. Some falls on rocky soil. And the seed that falls on rocky soil, there's enough soil for it to begin to grow. But when the sun comes out, it is scorched and it dies because the rocky soil means that it has no roots. Some is choked by weeds. It falls on soil where again it germinates and grows and starts to grow up. But there are also weeds in the field, there are weeds in that area and the weeds choke 
that we've done. So it, um, it can't be fruitful. And some lands in good soil and it produces an abundant crop. 30, 60, 100 fold. And all those numbers are, are big numbers. If you um, find someone from Lincoln and ask them about crop um, effectiveness and productivity, they'll be very impressed if you can generate a yield of 30, 60 or 100 fold in what you're, what you're doing. Uh, Tim Hodge, in his, in his own little um, part of the, the gardening world, is happy if he can produce one for one. If he plants one seed and produces one thing that he's, uh, that he's happy with. <laughs> so really, there's two long-term responses. There's some seed that produces nothing, and there's some seed that produces extraordinary fruitfulness. So although there are different routes to getting there, in the long term, there's really just two things that, uh, that happen. Something amazing and something sad. So Jesus decodes this parable for those that are intrigued. Notice who is there for the second half of the passage that we read. Who's there at the first bit? Loads and loads of people, so many people, Jesus has to preach from a boat. Who's there for the second bit? The disciples, the disciples and Jesus. And Jesus. And those who really wanted to know him. And some other people who are interested. So it's it's not just for the disciples, it's for those who, who want to find out what the meaning is. Particularly for the disciples, but there are others in that, in, in that circle as well. So he explains that the seed is the word of God, and the, the response that is seen in the ground is akin to different people's response to the word of God. It's not necessarily saying... This is what people are like. It's about this is how people respond to the, to the word of God. So he's saying the seed that falls on the path is like people who are hard and who Satan takes the, the word of God away from. So their hardness and the the nature of the battle means that it is taken away before it really starts to do anything in people's lives. The second response is the rocky ground, which sprouts but is um, rootless. And what Jesus talks about there particularly is that it's persecution and hardship. That these are people who respond initially enthusiastically and have a good first growth spurt, but when persecution and hardship come, they don't have the roots to sustain them, so they, um, they fall over. One of the, um, the things that I speak about quite often to students is the idea that they must be doing something wrong as Christians if they are experiencing suffering or persecution. But that isn't Christianity. That's, um, that's karma. Um, we're not the tertiary students Buddhist fellowship. So it is entirely expected that living in the world we will experience persecution and hardship. It's part of the normal Christian life. Seen that already from 1 Thessalonians. 
But it's something that Paul explains to people all the time, talking to Timothy. In this world you will have trouble. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's par for the, it's par for the courts. The third response is growth which is choked by competition. That again there is initial growth, but the, the weeds come in and choke the growth. And Jesus spells out what that competition is. That it comes down to the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things. I don't know how much you worry about stuff. But worry is something that the New Testament is quite clear on is a sin. Because it's really saying, I need to try and sort this out without trusting in God. The deceitfulness of, of wealth. What we desire. And what we believe that wealth will deliver for us. And the inherent emptiness and short-termism that money and wealth and possessions um, claim to provide, which ultimately is bankrupt. And the desire for other things, that we can't serve and please two masters, and if anything becomes more important to us than God, then that will be our God. I remember somebody um, speaking in our church a few years ago who was a visiting preacher and they said we don't have any idols in New Zealand. And I was sitting there thinking, sorry? There are all kinds of things that set themselves up to take God's place in our lives, in our in our society. And then the fourth um, response is those who listen and respond and grow and multiply and bear fruit um, abundantly. So, take a moment and turn to the person next to them. Next to you, even. <laughs> turn to the person next to them, that's probably you. <laughs> Don't work out that well for you. You turn to the person next to you and take a moment to explain to them the parable of the sower, the sower, the soil, or the seed, whichever you prefer, and how it relates to your experience of life and witness so far. It's interesting that the farmer throws the seed everywhere. I mean, if I were a farmer, I have much experience, but I would locate the good soil. <laughs> put the seed there and make that produce the fruit rather than wasting it everywhere else. Some of the seed fell on the carpet, some <laughs> fell in people's hair. <laughs>
I was struck by the thought that um, the farmers, you know, just merely sowing, there's no tillage or watering, digging and encouraging the seed to grow. It's, you know, the emphasis is purely on the power within the seed, mm. not on the farmer. And we know from other places in the New Testament that different kinds of crops require different kinds of response. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. Some things are watered and trees and tended. Yeah. Yeah. There is a similar parable where the kingdom of heaven is compared to a mustard seed that grows um, much, much bigger than could be expected or something like that. Yeah. Indeed, and that's a very parable thinking about on Thursday, so you can hold that thought. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's that there's a power in the Word of God, and God's Word does not return to Him empty. So having confidence in, in the Word of God, um, you know, if you look at if you look at the things that the the smart science student and the slightly smarter jazz student, you know, some of some of these things are really. Um, that, for example, is much more impressive than, than that. You're just looking at it. You didn't know what's more likely to get you a loaf of bread. You got the wing. I've already swapped it. Throw it, someone knock them out of it. You know, you, you, you can look at things and think, oh, that's much better. I mean, one of the, one of the big tricks of the, the devil is to convince the people of God that there are things that are more valuable and more powerful and more useful than the Word of God. And to divert us so that we lose our confidence and lose our, lose our focus. Anything else? I just sort of think it's interesting how it says, and they produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100, so like you're not all necessarily going to produce a great crop, it's going to produce some crop. Yeah, although those are all great crops. <laughs> some, some are greater than others. Exactly. Um, so some people, there's some they call there's some excretion, but when they grow older, they sort of like, I don't know, I'd be I'd I'd be quite careful categorizing what anybody was in terms of what kind of soil they they are. But I think what you do see is that people respond to God's word differently. And I don't think you would have to think very hard to think of somebody who started off as a Christian and was enthusiastic, but tough stuff started and they fell away. Or to think of, of somebody who, um, who was full of enthusiasm, but then other things started choking the, the life out of their faith, a relationship, or a career, or a hobby, or um, something which became more, more important. And the, the sadness of, um, of that, for sure. So we're going to come back to this, but we're going to take a little um, side uh, detour to think about some of the growth in our heritage.
which is really how God can use small things to, to do bigger things. And that's been part of the story of TSCA and of IFBS through history. So who knows about Howard Guinness? Okay. Howard Guinness um, was a medical student in the UK. And the students there had a vision to send him to North America to help start student work there. So they had a sale of their sports equipment and with the proceeds they bought him a one-way ticket on a boat across the Atlantic and a warm coat because he was going to Canada. And that was about as far as it stretched. On the journey across the Atlantic, the guy he was sharing a cabin with became a Christian. And when he got to Canada, he crossed the continent several times and started a camping ministry and a student ministry. Later on, in 1935-36, he was invited to come to New Zealand by the groups that were um, meeting in the four universities that existed in New Zealand at that time. You know where they were? Otago. Otago. Canterbury, Auckland, Rotorua. Victoria. And they had their, their first uh, conference. And I have in my office a photograph of that first conference. And the worst, pers dressed, the worst dressed person in that conference photograph is a lot better dressed than the best dressed person here. Um, <laughs> they're all wearing ties, apart from the girls wearing tweed skirts. And it was all um, very formal and jolly. And he did a tour of uh, New Zealand speaking to high schools and to uh, universities and at the end of, uh, of that the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship that became TACF was started and Crusaders that became Scripture Union was uh, started and there's been close links between those two organisations since so that we share an office building in, uh, in Wellington and are looking at ways of developing more um, partnership with school leaders. In the, in the future. In 1946, they had a conference of the different um, evangelical student ministries around the world to start an international fellowship. And New Zealand was one of the founding movements in the international fellowship of evangelical students. I think there was 10 or 12 um, movements in that first conference, the North America, <coughs> Australia, New Zealand, and some Northern European, UK, Scandinavia, Germany, and interestingly China was one of the, the founding movements of, um, of IPS and um, before the Cultural um, Revolution. I went to China after things started to change a little bit some years ago, and I met a couple of people there who'd actually run Bible study groups on campus all the way through when it had been illegal to to, to do that. And I think people were surprised actually at how much fruit there had been during the time that China was closed to, uh, to the gospel. Anybody here from Korea? Or been to Korea? You know how? You're not sure. <laughs> well, I did one day, so I wonder if you saw most things or? Uh, so, so trying, so <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you know how the gospel first came to Korea? There was a missionary from Wales who had been uh, preparing to go for some time and he arrived on the beach with um, various uh, Gospels, I think, in, um, in Chinese, possibly. Um, and within 20 minutes of landing on the beach, he was murdered. And they, um, they took his stuff and split it up. And they used the pages of the Gospels to um, line their toilets. 
And the church in Korea basically started with people getting converted, reading their wallpaper <laughs> while they were on the toilet. <laughs> so at one, one level you think, how ridiculous that somebody should spend years preparing and should arrive and die, but God was able to use them going to do something, to do something big. I went to Korea, um, the first world assembly that I went to for IPS was in Korea. And they had a slideshow of the growth of the student work in Korea from the sort of 1940s onwards. And you would see conference after conference, year after year, where there was 12 people, 15 people, 12 people, 20 people, 9 people, and it never got any bigger for about 30 years. And then suddenly things started happening, and the photographs started getting bigger, and the faces started getting smaller, until there was 500, 1,000, 2,000. Um, really through people taking God's word seriously and persevering over, over time. Student work in Jamaica was started by a man called Stacy Woods, who was one of the general secretaries of the International Fellowship of evangelical students. I never met him, but I met his uh, wife a few times. She just died last, uh, last year. Stacey Woods was on a plane that broke down in Jamaica. Now, if I was on a plane that broke down in Jamaica, and it was explained to me that it was going to take over a week for the parts to arrive to fix the plane, you would have found me on the beach. <laughs> Making nice things with umbrellas in them, <laughs> rejoicing in the goodness of God, finding <laughs> uh, a nice little bit of sand for me to paddle in while my uh, plane was getting fixed. And that's why I'm a spiritual pygmy and Stacey Woods is a spiritual giant. Because he thought, fantastic, this is an opportunity for me to try and see what's happening in students here. And at the end of the week, he um, had managed to get people together to start both the high school work and the student work. And then back to that um, plain breakdown as being um, when their movement uh, started. Just recently in the South Pacific, um, there's been some significant growth in Vanuatu. Andy and Ben and others have been able to support Steve Gibbs and the work that he's been doing there. At the South Pacific Regional event that we had in Fiji um, year past Easter, some students from the Solomon Islands stood together before God and said, we want to see student work starting in the Solomon Islands. And that was the first time students from that place had stood together like that. And there's been some things happened since, uh, since then. So the things that are in common with all that is there's people sowing abundantly. <laughs> it's not people kind of going, yes, I'll just make a little hole for this little seat here, and I'll go to what happens. Because at the end of the day, it's the realisation from the story that it's the farmer who sows. It's God who sows the, the seed. And we are just able to participate in that in ways that are um, tremendous. So this um, every four years, people get together from around the IFES uh, world. There's 120 movements, I think, in the, in the world now. It's got more at each, uh, at each world assembly. There'll be more joining this um, time. Uh, Andy, you've been to the world assembly. I'd like to share something from your world assembly experience. <laughs> Loads. Um, I've been twice and to a privilege to go. So in 2007, went to the World Assembly in Canada, uh, in, ironically, in a place called Hamilton. <laughs> they have a lot in common. Um, <laughs> and met a number of people there. Uh, one of whom is Dennis Kalama, who was, is, was then a student 
and is currently a member of staff in the Kenyan movement. I'm talking to Dennis about the work that he was doing and the student group that he was part of. He was tremendously encouraged that they'd seen growth in his small group from 80 people to 100, but he was hungry to see more, that the group might continue to grow. Spoke of the poverty that the students face, the reality of AIDS within their communities. And poverty not in the sense of something far off and distant, but something that really prevented people from studying and having kind of a consistent university life. Threat, uh, kind of the threat of strikes and shutdowns of university every week. So you'd come and you wouldn't know where your lecture would be there. But of the opportunities that that provided for students as well. So if the lecture didn't turn up, often one of the Christian group would stand up and share the gospel with the lecture room, often to much hassle and stress. Uh, in 2011, in Poland, I remember one day walking from the residence where we were through to the, the convention centre where the meetings were happening. And as always happened, kind of in the line of people, we just bumped into someone and met Lilith from Armenia. And so the, what do you do? So I'm the general secretary of Armenia. So um, I'm told a story of how her life had been dramatically changed through a really significant uh, road accident where every bone in her body was broken. And she was in bed for months for a couple and didn't know what God was going to do with her life. And she'd been living away from the Lord and living a compromised life, but on her sickbed, recommitted her life to the Lord and had this extraordinary encounter with him where she really kind of had this dream where she felt God said, I will send two men and they will offer you a job and you must take it. And two men turned up and offered her the job of general secretary of the movement. And so she said, well, I must say yes, as she's still recovering. Didn't really know much about the work and felt weak and broken. Um, and it's a, but that's just one story of every day. I've seen the way in which... <clears throat> I've seen the way in which God is doing extraordinary things to the most weak but amazing people. Um, and then we got to the auditorium that day to the Premier team and just sat with Angela from uh, Malawi and um, staff worker from America who was doing pioneering work amongst Latino students and just sharing the hope of the gospel um, and praying for one another. And, and in that prayer meeting, just wanted to observe there's been great encouragement in the work of music and report what God had been doing amongst the us. And they turned and said, that is amazing. Just such an encouragement. There's such an encouragement to us. Amen. And, you know, this is the encouragement. That we see growth through good and bad things. And for the opportunity to share that. You can go the same way as well. I was thinking about that. Um, I think for me, one of the greatest things was seeing and meeting people who were from some <clears throat> pioneering places, some that they said, don't say where we're from, and um, having lunch one day unexpectedly with some people from Southeast Asia and just hearing the persecution that they were under and the hardship and yet their energy and vision for reaching students and that was the commonality we all realized. This is a pivotal time in the life of people when they're thinking about they're leaving their parents, parent think, and they're thinking what am I going to believe now? The other thing was I was struck with some people that had served very long term and the, the perspective that they had and what they had seen by committing their lives to, to students. And a couple I sat next to, you know, they had translation, um, so sometimes the preaching would be in French and I would put my headphones on and I'd be in Spanish and I'd put my headphones on. 
And when I went to Spanish, I put my headphones on, and this couple next to me didn't. And I thought, oh, yeah, they were in Mexico for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And how they had influenced and planted and developed that work, and um, how God used so many people around the world, taking people from one place to another to, to bring the gospel. The final story was a, a story of persecution in an African country where um, they talked about, sort of in the shadows, they talked about how when students in that country go to a conference, they actually blindfold them so that they don't know where they're going. So they don't, and this is, then they go to someone's apartment or some, you know, this is a group of 25 or something that meet up. But then if they're ever interrogated, they don't know where they were. So you think, really? I mean, we just get a room, you know, we just meet, and we just come to El Rancho. So you realize that it's an incredible opportunity for just spreading that seed broadly. If I ever speak that we're all the same way they provide um, simultaneous translation into English. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else speak that we're all the same way? Oh yeah, I was um, uh, honoured and privileged to represent Masters TSA from New Zealand, um, Poland, 2011. Some of the stories to uh, Andy and Jane have uh, told us. And I decided to groups here, it's been um, a great to know some people in, in the smaller groups, and when there were 600 people at this, this event, uh, those groups became quite important. And I remember being in a group of eight, with an English-speaking group, only two of us had English as our native language. Um, other people had a second, fourth, fifth, sixth language. Um, and I was particularly struck with two people in that group, um, a Danish student and a student from a, a, another country that, that um, I wasn't and can't um, name because of the security implications. And just seeing the, the contrast between these two and how I was relating to what the Danish student was saying in terms of, you know, we're, we're doing this in our campus, doing this in our campus, but the apathy is, uh, is huge. And how the, uh, the, the lady from, our, from another country, she'd been through four countries to get to Poland to make sure the secret police didn't follow her. And when she heard about the apathy of um, students who lost it in Denmark and in New Zealand, she, um, she said, this is awful. We must, uh, we must pray. I can't imagine how bad that must be. And um, me and the Dane were kind of going, hmm, oh, we can't imagine what it's like in your country with the secret police on you. Um, so uh, it was, uh, it was uh, an honor and probably a, an event that, that gave me a great understanding of how God is working throughout the world, and for that I'm immensely grateful. At that um, World Assembly in uh, Canada, there used to be a kind of a, a notional limit, three delegates per country. Um, but Canada was a slightly bigger event, and I was quite keen to see more students attending World Assembly from New Zealand. So I wanted to take four students, which was a bit of a problem, because only had three um, spaces. But you know, with a bit of kind of wheeling and dealing, we actually kind of nudged the number up to four and then five and then eight. We <laughs> 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 nine of us there eventually. Um, but the <laughs> thing about that was that other people kept meeting students from New Zealand. Because we had the most students there of any country in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Including Canada, where the event was. <laughs> and they, um, this kind of got people thinking a bit in terms of if you know, New Zealand can get students to come to this, maybe we should be more to get more students to, to come. So in Poland, they had an event that started two days beforehand to invite students to come from other, from other countries. And they had much more students, and again, we had a similar number of students um, there. But it's, it started something going, where this kind of, the vision for students being more involved in, in IFDs, in kind of public ways, has become more of a thing. So there's now two student representatives on the IFDs International Executive. And at this World Assembly, um, they are asking two students to be involved in the Bible teaching. So each day there are two Bible teachers sharing the talk in the morning um, from different uh, countries. But we were asked to recommend someone from the South uh, Pacific. 
So knowing that he was smarter than a science student, we recommended Bain, and Bain has been invited to uh, take part in that. So he's going to Seattle next month for two days to join in with uh, the other people doing the Bible teaching at the, at the Royal Assembly. And I'm actually really excited by how um, we've had a small part in seeing students become more recognised within the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students. So we get to pray for Bain in that, because that's quite a big deal, um, to be um, doing some Bible teaching with all those people from different, uh, from different places. Um, and we've got a few people here who are going to the Royal Assembly. If you'd like to stand, if you're going to the Royal Assembly, this thing. <laughs> and there, um, there are a couple more students who are not uh, here at the moment, so I think there's 11 of us going all together. And for everyone apart from me, it'll be the first time at uh, a World Assembly. Um, and it's a fantastic opportunity. We have other opportunities, say Stan. We have other. <laughs> So it would be good to, um, to pray for uh, these folks and for the World Assembly that's uh, coming uh, up. But just before we, um, so just have a look at the moment where these people are standing and when they stand up again we'll try and move them around a little bit so you can gather around them and pray for them. So sit down now, thank you. It was just a really big encouragement to me, and it made me think of my own story at university on campus, because when I, was, when I first came to university, there was like this tiny group that had just restarted, and uh, at the end of the first year, we had two people in our group, and we were like the most desperate group on the whole of our tiger campus. At least it felt like that anyway. Um, but yeah, like four years down the track, that group is going strong, and we have a huge Otago contingent of people at this conference. And I think, like, taking that, yeah, that parable made me stop and reflect on, like, what God has already done. Yeah. And it makes me even more excited about what He will do in the future. Cool.